please just type into the chat and I'll be monitoring those. Um, and uh, this is this uh, Monday nights we're going to be do these be doing these everyday framing um, workshops. They're standalone, one time only. Uh, you can sign up for every Monday, but they don't build on each. Well, they build on each other, but they're not like dependent upon each other. Starting tomorrow night, we will be doing um, our online version of our workshop, and uh, that will be over four one-hour. Um, meetings on Tuesday nights. So starting tomorrow for the next four Tuesday nights. Those do build on each other and depend on each other. If you have taken our workshop in the past, it's the same content. So just know that if you want to get the same content again, that would be great. Uh, but otherwise know that you wouldn't be learning anything brand new at that. And so with that, I will turn it over to George. And we'll, we'll also be, rec oh, and thank you, Lisa. <laughs> um, we will be uh, recording this because I want to put this onto YouTube um, for uh, for others to watch after we're done. So if if you don't want to be on TV or have your voice uh, uh, there, you can mute and uh, like a lot of people have turned off their uh, video, but uh, use the chat then to ask questions. So um, and one other thing, can you? Um please uh, mute yourself if you're not talking. And then that way the person who is talking can be heard. Here's a Zoom secret. If you're muted and you press the space bar and hold it, you unmute for as long as you hold the space bar down. Just a free Zoom tip. Who knew? So, okay, so this is a, a weekly series on framing and messaging. We, we've traveled around in Minnesota. We've been to Michigan for a fabulous week in Michigan, which was great. We've been out to, uh, to uh, New Mexico and, uh, and, uh, and even in, into Wisconsin. And so we thought we needed to take this because we can't do in-person workshops. We thought we needed to take this uh, out onto the internet. And so I'm really happy all you guys are there. Please spread the word, let people know about it. Uh, what, we're, what we want to do in this everyday framing on on Monday nights is to, I mean, there are so many topics to talk about with framing and how that applies to our everyday work in the field, which is now doing what we're doing now with Zoom or on social media, because we're probably not gonna meet too many voters in person. So we're trying to, um, trying to take what, what we have to present in these meetings and try as much as we can to apply it to how we have to do things today. Um, I don't know that we'll always be that, but we're, we're, we're shooting for that. Uh, where the topics are intended to give you tools as well as the skills uh, to persuade voters. And um, you'll also, as we do this, you'll come to understand why, you know, they'll come out in conversation, but you'll understand why conservatives believe what they believe and also uh, why we believe what we believe. And a lot of times our, uh, our uh, you know, we and our Democratic colleagues and liberal colleagues can't always tell people what a liberal is. And so that'll come out in these two, so that you'll feel comfortable about saying who we are. And we also are planning to have some special guests from time to time. Um, I'm probably not spilling any beans or putting anybody on the spot by saying we'll do something with the Minnesota Rural Caucus with Linda Larson, because Linda's awesome and the Rural Caucus is so important to victory in every single state. Any rural stuff, if, if Democrats don't get rural, we don't get elected. We have to do that. And in fact, we've spent most of our time in the in-person workshops uh, out of the metro area uh, in Minnesota and Wisconsin. So, okay. So anyway, also lastly, please feel free to ask questions at any time. This is not as much of a formal presentation as it might be tomorrow night when we're doing the workshop. So if you've got a question, go ahead and interrupt me. Uh, Lisa does, so you may as well too. <laughs> so, uh oh, <laughs> so, all right. So today's topic, I thought I'd bring this up because we get this question an awful lot. In fact, it's probably the question we get the most. And that is, what do I say when those guys say, you know, whatever uh, today's latest absurdity is. And I thought I'd, I'd uh, take a different tack on this because we as Democrats feel that we have to respond 
we we hear you know you, if you watch Trump every day, the first thing we think about what are we what are we going to say about that stupid thing he just said right? We spend a tremendous amount of time thinking about Trump, thinking about Mitch McConnell saying something as stupid as he did yesterday, which was, well, if they're getting six hundred dollars but they were only making three hundred, why would we want to give him six hundred dollars? And of course, the question doesn't occur to Mitch that who can live on three hundred dollars a week, right? But uh, you know, we 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 want to respond. So I want to want to put it to you that maybe responding is not the best thing to do. So um, uh, th and it's a natural tendency we have. So you kind of have to pull back from doing that and say, is there some other way I can communicate? I'll have a real good example of that later on. Uh, but uh, that's that's what I want you to first think. You don't always have to respond. You're also under no obligation to respond to your opponent uh, or even to an interviewer, as we might see later. You may feel that because someone asked you a question, you have to answer. Uh, if you've read Al Franken's, one of Al Franken's books, he talks about how uh, his staff had to train him to pivot because it just, ne he, he couldn't get around the idea that if someone asks a question, we shouldn't answer it. And so uh, that, of course, Al's a lot funnier than I am when we talk about that. But um, also understand that you are quite often being baited by the Republican strategists and uh, ergo your opponents and the media. So uh, they want to engage you in a conversation because if they ask you a question, you're more likely to respond to them within their frame. And what I mean by that is uh, we've used the example in some of the workshops about immigration. So if you, uh, you, you'll hear a conservative talk about uh, immigrants as criminals. And so then what do we do? Well, you know, they're not all murderers and rapists and criminals. When what we should be saying is, you know, these people are refugees and we, we need to change the frame. So I, I won't get into the whole thing there, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, th does this make sense? Does anybody have any questions or comments on that? And if you're muted, you can, you know, just remember to unmute with the space bar. Okay, as we say in the DFL, or the Democratic Party, hearing none, seeing none, <laughs> go to the next one. So this is really all about learning to pivot. And I know there are candidates here, because I can see them, and uh, people who've been candidates and, and elected officials before. And I'm sure many of you eventually learn to pivot if you didn't do it right away. And pivoting is simply saying, I know you want to talk about that, but I want to talk about this. And it can be related on the issue, but you're saying it the way you want to, or you can change the issue entirely. Uh, kind of like we have a Toastmasters uh, person here, I know, because she's in our Toastmasters club, Jolene. And uh, it's like when you get table topics and you don't want to answer the table topics to question, you say, I'm not going to answer that. And you answer something you feel like answering. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to say you're not going to answer that. You just start answering it differently. You don't mm -hmm. have to even signal that you're going to answer it differently. So, the, I mean, it's a habit that we get into that's important to, to, to think about getting out of and getting into the pivot. So that should be a top of mind. And, and if you, uh, and that could be hard to do. Uh, if you've taken the workshops, you know that we talk about stop, drop, and roll as a method to remember how to uh, be able to come up with a good frame for something. And real quickly, uh, stop and analyze what's going on and don't respond immediately, if, if you can. The more you do this, the easier it comes to you. I see Rick Studer on here, he's a master of this. He's very, very good at these things and has been at it actually longer than I have, I think since the late Cretaceous era, if I'm not mistaken. So, but uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, this is, um, uh, sorry. That's where I was at. Okay, so anyway, this idea of pivoting, it takes practice. So the, the stop uh, part of it is stop and analyze what's going on. Don't immediately respond. The drop part of it is, fi you know, figuring out what the conservative frame is, which you did in the stop analysis. Figure out what the conservative frame is. You want to know what that is so you don't respond in that frame. And you also want to look for their code words so you don't do that. And then there are a number of other 
bad habits that everybody gets into using too much facts and logic, um, you know, taking the bait, things of that sort. Uh, so you do that and then roll with a well-framed message and the workshops talk about that also. So that's, um, that's kind of where, uh, kind of the first thing I wanted to talk about. Does that make sense to people? Is there any questions on that? We'll have plenty of time for discussion later. <laughs> so throw that there. Um, let me throw another one out here. Lisa was reading uh, one of the blog posts we have and reminded, uh, and reminded us to, uh, uh, or reminded me, we should talk about frame constraint, which has a lot to do with what we were just talking about. And what happens is if like, like there, again, if we use the immigration example, when you talk about immigrants as criminals, then there's a whole story that goes along with that because in everyone's brain, there are brain cells, clusters of brain cells and a network of brain cells that understand what a criminal is. The criminal is a bad person. Someone who saves you from the criminal is a good person. And if you are victimized by a criminal, you are a victim. So if you talk about immigration and you stay in the crime frame, then what happens is your answer will be in the conservatives frame. You don't want to be in that frame and that's why you switch to refugee. And if you do that, uh, and that's, that's one frame, but it's a powerful one now, especially about what's going on at the Southern border. And um, so then you have the opportunity then in the refugee frame to talk about empathy and caring for other people. The, uh, the victims in that story are the, re the, in the refugees, the, uh, the heroes in that story are people who are trying to help the refugees and the, the villains in that story are the people who are locking children in cages, taking them away from their folks and in general just messing things up as they are. And that victim, uh, villain and hero uh, story is a very common one in politics. And we can tell that. I don't think we have to be negative about things, but I think it's important to uh, to think about that kind of a story when we're doing it. But you can see how if, uh, if, you're, if the frame you choose is a good frame, it will tell a story. And in that story are things that can happen and things that can't happen. Like if we're talking about refugees, we're not talking about elephants. We're not talking about transportation, you know, there things like that. There are also other parts of the story. Like we're not talking about criminals. We're not talking about, um, you know, kids and cage, or we're not talking about um, uh, the wall, although apparently uh, Mexico is keeping us out. So maybe they will pay for that wall after all. <laughs> I don't know. So, uh, so that whole idea of frame constraint is very important. And so uh, whenever you're looking at the frames that the conservatives are giving you, think about how that constrains what the conversation will be. And then turn around and when you find a good frame for us, use that frame and, and think about how that story plays out and what gets talked about in that frame. Comments. I have never seen such a silent group of Democrats in my life. <laughs> it's okay, you can talk. I know, I know Bob Malecki, if we let him talk, he'll go all night. <laughs> Well, I, uh, this is Linda Larson. I, I do have a comment uh, that I frequently use when people um, present something about immigrants in a negative light. I say uh, the group home that my daughter lives in has, is completely staffed by immigrants. And she would not have the help she needs if it weren't for them. They really provide a lot of stability for her and they add a lot of economic of viability. And what is it that you're objecting to about immigration? And I, and I, I'm able to, to change the direction of it. I mean, who can, or, and uh, one person I said, do you want to apply for that job in the group home that she lives in? And of course not, you know, so I, I like being able to um, listen to the question, pick up what their frame is, and then turn it into something positive. Yeah. 
And, and uh, one other really important thing about what you just said was you have a personal story. And a personal story, you know, if, if you can always bring whatever the issue is down to people and personal stories, you will almost always find it a lot easier to find the moral frame because all politics is moral. That's what we're after. We're looking for moral frames. So collect stories. When you, if, especially if you're a candidate, you should be collecting stories all the time. You want a story that you retell to be a story that you experienced or that you heard from someone you know who experienced it. No third-hand ones, because you always want to be authentic when you're doing this. You will come across authentic when that happens. I mean, unless it's an example of if you're talking about, say, George Floyd, you can do that, uh, you know, and repeat that story. But otherwise, um, it should be somebody something you've got. And then one other thing you mentioned, Linda, on that, which is kind of, kind of important to bring up the whole idea about taking jobs from Americans. Um, and this is I don't know that I would say, say, uh, say this, but uh, have you seen the show Dirty Jobs? Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen that on cable. And this guy just goes and does all these really terrible jobs. They're, you know, cleaning things that nobody would want to clean, things like that, uh, uh, chasing bugs and being an exterminator. And, um, and, uh, and it turns out that Americans do all do these jobs, but a lot of them will not do jobs because they won't do it for the pay that's offered, which then begs the question, why, why is this job so underpaid? And why do we feel that a, uh, you know, a dollar fifty basket of strawberries couldn't cost a dollar sixty to put ten cents more back in the farmer's part pocket, and uh, pocket of the people who picked the strawberries. So that's pretty good. Linda, okay. Linda knows this stuff. A, I can see you haven't been shopping for a while. <laughs> and B, uh, we have another question. Um, what are some of the common frames for conservatives? And that's to you, George. Oh, I'll okay. answer that. Uh, well, conservatives, conservative frames are the 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 one that's and and uh, we'll we'll take a little side detour into that right now. The um, uh, a conservative frame that's very popular right now. You're hearing around the stimulus. You'll hear it a lot the next few days, and they're being careful not to explicitly state it. But the bottom line is they don't think that people who are not working deserve to get any money if they could help it. They certainly don't deserve to get more. They may understand the economic necessity of the first stimulus, but already their, their conservative, their, their radical conservatism, I should say reactionary conservatism is pulling them back uh, right now because they're looking at, we don't want to put a lot more money out. And that's because in the conservative worldview, if you are not working, you have chosen not to work, therefore you have, or take advantage of the opportunities that uh, uh, the capitalism gives you. So therefore you don't deserve uh, any but the most barest of help in any way. And we know of course right now that so many people are out of work through absolutely no choice of their own and that most of the people who are in poverty would much prefer to work than not. And so that, often, but that's a, that's a common frame here. And often I think, um, and, and you can find uh, some of these things too, if you go to uh, connectionslab.org and go to the Knowledge Center, uh, George has put up a lot of information about uh, framing and, and uh, worldviews and things like that. Um, one example that's in there is about healthcare. Uh, again, a conservative uh, frame on that is always uh, in the uh, economic area and it's about all about being transactional and things like that when really um, another frame for healthcare is caring for people and making sure that people are healthy and making sure that people can get the medical care that they need so that's a difference how democrats and or liberals and conservatives can think about something like healthcare, where the conservative puts it in the economic mode again and takes the and takes people out of it mm -hmm. um so, okay, we, we've talked about getting out of automatically responding, just not, not thinking that you need to respond uh, and learning to pivot. We talked a little about stories and frame constraint. Uh, what I wanted to, uh, what do you do if, you know, when you need, when you're called on to do this, to message, you should endeavor to spend 95% of your time on your message. 
So if, uh, which means you may at some point be compelled to uh, respond. You may be in a situation where you absolutely have no choice to respond to what uh, your opponent is saying if you're a candidate, uh, for example. And, uh, but even though you have to respond with the pivot, you can spend your time talking about what you want and they may continue to pepper you on it, and you can just continue to not answer their question and answer the one you want to. You know, you don't want to look evasive in front of a voter, for sure. But you just, you know, you can always say, well, I hear what you're saying, but I look at it differently, and then talk about how you see it differently. And that doesn't necessarily diss what they said. It just says, you look at it differently, consider my point of view. So that's a, another way to do it. But again, you're getting back to our messages. So that means it's incumbent on you to know what our messages are and to, and to think about those and practice with that so you're ready when they come up. And through the workshops and through these things, we hope that that becomes easier. Um, um, can I just say, I'll, and I, I, I would encourage everybody also to look at the chat if you're not already doing that. Virginia just posted a link to an article uh, that's hot off the press. And, and so if you uh, want to look at that, just you can click on it, it'll open up the article, and then you can read it later on. But if it, once this meeting is done, then that then the chat is gone. So, uh, but I, I haven't looked at the article that uh, Virginia uh, sent through, but um, I'm going to pull that up for later. And I'm putting in a quick one here that articles, oop, if I could only spell. at connectionslab.org. I didn't make it a clickable link because I'm talking. Um, one other thing that comes up a lot in this same vein is what about debunking? So we, you know, we hear a lot, for example, in climate, uh, for the climate crisis, what we hear is uh, Bill Nye, who's, who's great, and he's a very good communicator. Uh, one thing he's done, though, that I, I don't like is that he spent time talking to, uh, he goes on stage with a climate denier. He'll do this with uh, creationists also. And he gets on stage and he debates them. And the problem with that is a lot of times, you know, then what happens is in the case of climate, of, of the climate crisis, the issue is, is, is the climate crisis, crisis real? Because he's arguing with somebody about it. So the entire thing is about whether it's real or a hoax. And that's not a good frame to stay in. And uh, the other thing is, is you've now taken your position uh, about the climate crisis, which is solidly, solidly grounded in science, and you, and you basically put it on par with basically crackpot theories that are really, you know, any science they've got is science that's been either bought and paid for by the oil companies or come out of whatever the Flat Earth Society, whatever, <laughs> some other, uh, some other wacky group. And so, you know, you don't want to reinforce that. So debunking carries a danger that you will inadvertently stay in the conservative frame. And that's not, that's not helpful. I have a question on that, George, if you don't mind. Not at all, Jason. Jason, um, candidate. Yep, thank you, uh, 35B. Because I've, I've done this, I, I've, I've read this in, in so many books about exactly what you're saying, which is, um, you know, say, say just as a weird example, your, uh, your opponent comes out and says, uh, Jason Ruffles a deadbeat landlord. So, of course, I go on record and say, I'm not a deadbeat landlord. And, of course, the headlines the next day say, Jason Ruffalo, not a deadbeat landlord. <laughs> and I, I think what you're saying is don't use that, that the vernacular they're using because it, it comes back to haunt you. Even if you deny it, you're still, it's still free publicity. But with regard to that, how do we address these things? Because there's going to be a lot of stupidity that we have to address throughout the course of, of our campaign going up to November 3rd. How do we do that without saying it when, when we need to address the topic but not bring it to the forefront of the conversation? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It makes a lot of sense. And I have to say, Jason, um, we've, we've talked quite a bit. And Jason mm -hmm. has had some great questions that are forming the basis of some of the future webinars we'll be doing. Uh, what I would say is first, try to, I mean, you sometimes have to do this on the fly, but try to sift through what you're being, uh, you know, what they're saying about you or what they're saying at all, and try to say what out of this is really important that I respond to. A good chunk of it is just not worth it. Because if you respond to it, then you, you're going to end up 
it's going to become a, a thing. It's like, uh, what, what's the, the Barbara Streisand effect? Oh, yeah. How's that go again? Liz? It's the Streisand effect. When you uh, call attention to something so much that then that becomes the story rather than um, people would have just forgotten about it before, but you brought, bring so much attention to it. Uh, like Trump did with the book uh, written by his niece. Uh, he does that and then that creates a lot more buzz around that book than there might have been if he just would have just left that alone. Right. But I, and, and Jason's is, is even more specific. His question is more specific in that he's saying, what if somebody attacks me personally? And there are some times when you're good, you may need to do that. If it's completely absurd, I just let it go by. If it's something that's not going to gain, like, you know, like you beat children in public or something, you know, it may not even be worth a response uh, mm -hmm. at all, just because you don't want to draw attention to it. But there will be times when you'll have a serious, uh, somebody will make a serious charge against you. And, uh, you know, you have to be <clears throat> truthful about things. I mean, if you really do beat children in public, you're best to own it up right, right away and uh, say that everybody who waits and dithers ends up paying a higher price for it. Um, can I ask about that very specific uh, example of the deadbeat landlord? If, would it make a difference if you said, um, not that I'm not a deadbeat landlord, but I am a great landlord and I take care of the people who uh, live in my buildings or whatever. Could you take that and turn it into a positive and maybe that's the story that's told? Like uh, Jason Ruffalo is a great landlord. I don't know. Could could you do that? Sure, you could. Yeah, you you could say, I am a landlord, and you know what? I think I I strive to make sure my buildings are maintained. People have what they need. I treat my my renters fairly. I don't know where my opponents get in this. For the record, I'm absolutely not a landlord. That was just an example I was bringing up. And for the record, he's also not a deadbeat. <laughs> <laughs> He's quite the candidate. <laughs> okay. George? Yes. Um, I suggest that you could also throw in some Connections Lab uh, 101 and, and uh, a statement, uh, something like, uh, I value decency and dignity. Therefore, you know, I take care of my, my, my people. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you take the workshop more than once? <laughs> Three times. Great workshop. No, that's, yeah, that's, that's perfect. If you can turn right around and add a value into it, that's great. We'll, we'll do another one of these on value framing versus non-value framing, because we really hit value framing very hard because we don't do it enough as Democrats. So that's been a big focus of ours, but it is possible to do framing that's not necessarily uh, uh, done uh, directly connected to values. And we'll, we'll talk about that later, but uh, Bob's right. That's, that's always a great way to go about it. Were there any other questions on that? And Jason, did we answer that question well enough? Yeah, yeah, thanks George, I appreciate it. Okay, so, um, okay, so the next thing would be, what do you do if you absolutely have to respond? And that kind of is a segue from what Jason was saying. Um, then you can do a thing called the truth sandwich. And then I have a different version of it called the truth sub sandwich. And uh, what the truth sandwich is, is what you do first is you start, you basically state what the truth is. You know what your opponent or what the conservative message is, but you start by stating the truth. Then the inside of the sandwich covered up by the buns is you indicate that the lie is a distraction from the truth. And then you follow up with returning to the truth. And then I have a slight, a slight, a slightly different take on it, which is uh, you start by talking about the truth and then stating what the real issue is. Again, it's kind of like pivoting, but the real issue is not as Mitch McConnell thinks giving people more money than they made. The real issue is how in the world can you live on $300 a week? So find what the real issue is. Many times conservatives, if not most of the time, conservatives will be making an issue of something that hides the real issue or obscures it. Another great reason to stay out of their frame. Uh, and the other part of this first part of the truth sandwich is that whoever, whoever frames first gets the advantage. 
So you kind of want to get out in front. We're not really good at that on our side. The conservatives are very good at it. In fact, they look to, uh, they, they look for ways to get out in front of us quite often by stealing what our message ought to be. So think about that. And then um, in, when you indicate what the lie is for the middle part of the sandwich, avoid repeating your exponent, opponent's specific language and stay out of their frame. And then uh, always repeat truths more than lies when you return to the truth for the bottom part of the bun. And let me give you an example of that. Um, if we were talking about voting, the truth, the, the Republicans are talking about mail-in ballots and fraud and all of this, which is a bunch of, a bunch of uh, hooey. So, uh, and specifically about vote by mail. So the truth, the real issue, is that the GOP's ongoing voter suppression tactics of caging, purging, restricting of polling places, et cetera, puts our right to vote, our elections, and our democracy in grave danger. Now we go ahead and we can acknowledge the lie. Vote, uh, we can also say um, uh, that any talk of vote by mail being insecure is simply not supported by the facts. Any talk otherwise is a distraction from the GOP's widespread voter suppression. And then to reiterate the truth again at the last part, voter suppression is morally wrong, anti-democratic, and racist. Let me say that again. Voter suppression is morally wrong, anti-democratic, and racist. And I threw that in twice at the end there, because sometimes if you repeat it, that's going to stick foremost in people's heads, then they'll come away with that. You've really nailed the point. And so th th I know this truth sandwich can be a little tricky. Does this make sense? Any questions on that? It's a real good way for candidates to... Uh, to, uh, you know, be able to talk about tough things and turn it to their advantage. It's uh, the truth sandwich is another way to pivot. It just gives you a nice little formula. It sounds like something that one would get better at with practice. Yes, absolutely. Uh, one thing about framing and messaging is that uh, it's not very easy to do just hearing about it today and doing it this afternoon. The more you learn about it, the more you see it in action, and the more you're able to do it. I still struggle with it. I still have to keep up on it. And it's just something that you that you practice. And uh, by practicing it, especially using the stop, drop and roll, you know, that helps use that when you go when you if you're watching TV. And if you haven't taken the course yet, there is some some information on the website about stop, drop and roll. Uh, and then also, if you want to come to the Tuesday night sessions, we'll go into that in detail in the third session of that. But uh, that kind of thing, you can sit there with the, the, the checklist and just watch Fox News if you can take it for 20 minutes. I'm sure you'll find plenty to unpack there <laughs> and use that and that should help you out quite a bit. George, uh, this is Tom Kike. Hey, um, so you talk about practice. What's the best way to practice? I mean, having actually doing it with somebody in your campaign and saying, okay, here's the issue. Let's talk about it. I'll take the conservative viewpoint. You take the other one and let's practice this. You know, having a practice partner in this is great. If you can do that, absolutely. And on a campaign, you know, campaigns don't always have time uh, to do that. But if it's uh, Sunday morning and people are at the campaign, you're not calling until noon anyway. So uh, it might be a time to do it. That's always really good. Um, that stop, drop, and roll, there's uh, a checklist on the website uh, in, the, in the Knowledge Center. And, so, and also in the uh, workshop resources center, there's a more detailed one, which is handy for campaigns. But yeah, go through that. At the very least, watch Fox News and try to uncover the frames that they're using in their arguments on any particular issue. If that's all you do to begin with, then now you're at least getting what it is they're saying, and you know to stay out of that. And then the next thing is to, uh, and we've done in the workshops, we've done this. I'll hold this up. You won't be able to read the whole thing. But we have these cards. They're also on the website. And my camera may not focus. There we go. These values here are ones that 
Took me a little while to come up with, it's changed over time, but these are the, if I, somebody said, what are core liberal values? These are core liberal values. And I'm even thinking that the word empathy, which is a, a Lakoff's word, the word empathy, actually, uh, I think we need to go farther because a core value that we have is love in the agape sense, or agape, uh, you know, that, that we have love for our fellow man and for our, our uh, other people and, and the planet and the animals on it. And so that motivates a lot of what we do. We wouldn't, we wouldn't do the things we do if we didn't care about it. Uh, this, the values on this card are also on the website. And I do, if you've been to the workshop, we've handed you one of these. It's changed a little bit over time and we have more of these, so we can do that. I can also, um, I'll see if I can get an easy handout for you to use at the, uh, in your uh, campaigns because you can put those values up on the wall someplace and tell people if you're trying to, you know, if you're talking to a voter and you don't know what to, um, what to say about something because you don't know everything about that subject. You, but you, you probably do know how you feel about it and what's right and wrong about it. If you can talk about right and wrong with the voter and you can use one of these words to help you, then you and the voter are having a moral conversation. And I'll guarantee you, most of the voters don't know a whole lot about this stuff either. They'll probably be relieved because they can talk about right and wrong, but they're not gonna be talking about every uh, tiny uh, bit of information on public policy. So um, what I'd like to do, because I wanna make sure we have time, uh, I told you I'd show you a good example. This I saw a couple weeks ago, I think. And uh, let me share my screen. I'm going to run this. It's some video. I'm keeping the video small on the screen because I think if it's bigger, it'll eat up too much bandwidth and may jerk around on you. So is that, does that come up? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to play this here. And uh, I've put on the side uh, some things that Nancy Pelosi is doing. And you may see other things. I thought she was absolutely brilliant here. And you'll see the things we were just talking about. Uh, President Trump, a distraction. A hundred thousand people. Capitol Hill. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Madam Speaker, thank you for joining us on a very busy day. First of all, your reaction to this proposed crackdown from the White House against the social media companies. I think it's just typical of uh, President Trump, a distraction. A hundred thousand people, more than a hundred thousand people, have died from the coronavirus. This administration has been a failure in terms of what we're doing on testing, treating, testing, tracing, treating, and isolating people. The president has been a terrible example of not wearing a mask, making, belittling those who do. So anything he does is a distraction from the problem at hand. People are dying and someone is burning and all people want to talk about is what he said next about this. That is a success for him. So I just, I just will not go there. It's about testing, 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 to open up our schools so our children can go back safely. It's about opening up our economy so that we can flourish. So it's about saving lives. And all of this is a distraction from the problem at hand. We have people dying and he's talking about one thing and another and then mobilizes the whole conversation. I just simply won't go there. Well, but let me just ask you, because the... Let me stop that for a second. What was the original question about? What was the topic of the original question? Rick? You're, you're muted. Just press the... Uh, the, the... Uh, hi, George. i taken off. Okay. I'll be around. Oh, okay, Rick. See ya. Thanks. The initial reason that uh, Jack Dorsey used for fact-checking him was on mail-in voting, and he is... Well, I guess that answered the question. Somehow I hit my mouse. Um, the, uh, the original question was on uh, Twitter and Facebook, Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg. And did Nancy Pelosi in that part of the interview answer any of that? No. She didn't go anywhere near it. 
So then um, Andrea Mitchell, who is a great reporter. So this is, she's not, she's, she's doing her job, but uh, Nancy Pelosi is going to talk about what she wants to. So here we go. He is potentially influencing the, the accuracy, the possibility of the election. Well, he does if we uh, take it up. Which is another very important say, issue. Let me just say, as far as, the, we, as, far as far. the platforms are concerned, they want two things from the federal government, no regulation and no taxes. And so they cater uh, to the Trump administration all the time. I think that Mark Zuckerberg's statement was a disgrace. And, and Twitter, they're not taking off any accusations the president's making about Joe Scarborough. They know that's not true. So they do a token thing and think it's okay. So again, uh, there's, I don't know if there's honor among thieves, uh, but that's the, uh, they only have a business model to make money, not to convey facts. That's, that's what they're about. So again, I see it as a distraction uh, from what is the challenge at hand, which is to save lives. And every day the president comes up with another stunt and every day uh, the airwaves are full of that stunt without holding him fully accountable for the lives that are lost because we don't have under his leadership an appropriate testing. Now we do in the HEROES Act. HEROES Act has a robust, rapid testing uh, where we're reaching out to underserved communities, communities of color which are seriously affected disproportionately, where we're saying that we are going to test, we're going to trace, we're going to treat, we're going to save lives as we engage in isolation and the rest. Countries, other countries have not had the death toll. Some of the other countries haven't. They don't have a vaccine. They don't have any cures, but they do have good practices. And the president is a bad example. And, and we exactly, we have to keep our eye on the ball of saving lives to open the economy uh, so that we can uh, come back even stronger working together. So, how did uh, how do you George, think you George? Uh, I'd say that was a terrific example of pivoting. Mm -hmm. I uh, I didn't quite understand it until I saw Nancy Pelosi. Now uh, I'm with it. Yeah, and um, and do you think that uh, she used uh, that she said Mark Zuckerberg on purpose? <laughs> I kind of wonder because yes. Zuckerberg sounds like knucklehead. And uh, Nancy Pelosi is pretty smart. I think she knows what the guy's name is after all this time. So I kind of, she kind of slipped that in there and made it look like it was a mistake, but I don't know. She's pretty crafty. What, how did that make you feel though when you were listening to Nancy Pelosi talk? Or did you see anything else in that, uh, in that uh, exchange that uh, you wanted to bring up? Well, it made me feel good. It made me feel like, boy, here's a fighter. Here's somebody who's not going to let somebody else take control of the conversation away from her. She's going to get her point across. Yeah. And she's going to still make transitions. I think Nancy Pelosi does a really good job of um, presenting herself as a strong leader with integrity and with some spine. She doesn't back down from anything. And when we first started talking about this this evening, I, I was reminded of um, some time when she was interviewed on television, somebody asked her a question and she said, I will not dignify that with an answer. She's not I, she, is, she is just, you know, you can, I mean, she just doesn't back down and that's, what we need in somebody to counter the, the messaging that comes from the Republicans. Yeah. Especially with a message about us. And uh, on, the, on the chat, uh, people said that she uh, sounds like she has command of the issues and that she pivoted without appearing evas evasive, which uh, is great because I've seen so many times when uh, Republican uh, Congress uh, people are interviewed like on Face the Nation or whatever, and they sound very evasive when they're actually just trying to pivot. So she did, uh, didn't did sound evasive. Um, and then, oh, Jolene asked, okay. Yeah, and maybe, um, I think, George, did you put the, um, did you put that up on our, on the website, the Nancy Pelosi uh, video? No. 
put that, make a note. So we'll get that up on our website at connectionslab.org uh, if you, um, so for people who want to be able to grab that. Kathy? Yes, I, uh, I, I felt that she cared about me and people uh, who are suffering. So uh, uh, she, had a, she got her message out. I like that part. I, I'd like to add that it was, yeah, bringing us back to this is serious, this is what's happening, and shifting all of our focus on what is important. And um, I agree with what Kathleen said too, so, yeah. Jason? Just quickly, yeah, thank you. Uh, I agree with everything that's been said, but it kind of it kind of puts us in a little bit of a different light for me. So we talked about framing, what to say and what not to say, but something that my campaign and, and I have been struggling with a little bit is the aggressiveness. Like Nancy Pelosi, she stands on a, a, a high uh, pedestal, and of course she should. Um, she has a little more authority to speak the, her mind, and and truth be told, we're trying to figure out. Like I'm running in a really red district. So does that message change? Does I wouldn't call it the aggression. The, the, does the assertiveness change with regard to being in a red district? Because we don't want my opponent to land the first blow, but at the same time, we don't want to come out as overly ag aggressive or exuberant. So maybe can you speak to like um, how how do we speak that message more or less aggressively based on the sort of the climate that we're in with re regard to our our districts? That's a really excellent question. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I think it's important that, pe that, that, that people see Democrats as truly believing what they say. And too often we're making excuses for what we're saying, or we, we go, well, you know, we don't want to offend anybody, uh, or I, I, you know, um, I don't want to disagree with you. Uh, whereas uh, sometimes that comes across as weak. I mean, what do people say about Democrats? That, uh, Linda brought the word up before, spineless. And um, so I think if you are speaking the way Nancy Pelosi does, maybe not quite as forcefully, perhaps, but if you're speaking that way, you, there's an authenticity that comes with that, that, that you don't get with some of the dissembling that we do sometimes. Um, uh, I don't, uh, th that touches a little bit on negative stuff, and I think we'll do negative, um, which actually came out of a question you asked in a meeting we had earlier, Jason, but um, I want to talk about that in another session, about when we should go negative and if we should. Linda? Well, I'd like to uh, respond Jason, to Jason. I, I see Nancy Pelosi as being highly assertive because she's passionate and uses strong language talking about the issue. But I do not her as being aggressive, you know, like going after somebody. I think there's an important distinction to be made there. You know, the person who's aggressive is the one who's going to walk away from you or is going to attack you back. But an assertive uh, response or an assertive statement is simply stating your own beliefs or values or viewpoints, whether you love it. it's like it's my truth. I don't need your approval to speak what I stand for. That's I. That's the distinction I see between Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump. Actually, yeah, he, and that makes sense, Linda, as I look at it, because Nancy Pelosi attacks Trump on his policy, whereas he would attack her on some physical feature or something like that. Like you can attack the policy. That's not personal. That's just on record of what they've done. So maybe that's the distinction that's for me. I, I like the idea, Linda. Thanks for that. He's aggressive. She's assertive. Yep. That's, yep. That's exactly it. Nice. And, uh, and we should point out here that uh, in, in the past, I mean, thank, thank goodness Nancy Pelosi is out there and, and other uh, female members of Congress uh, are out there speaking in a very authoritative way and a very confident way because uh, there, there have been so many times in the past where what, uh, what a, a woman would say or, or what a guy would say, a woman couldn't say and they, because they'd say, oh, she, and th this happened with uh, Hillary and with, with a lot of other female candidates all, you know, since female candidates were allowed to run <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, I, I think it's great now that that you see this in national leadership. You see Stacey Abrams, you see other 
uh, you know, Kamala Harris and others come out and they're just, they're kicking butt. And that's great because, you know, people, there are people now who are turning away from the Republican Party, uh, including a lot of very prominent Republicans. And they are, many are endorsing Joe Biden. And there are people there who uh, have been used to thinking that their leaders need to be strong. They've been voting for leaders because the leaders told them they were strong. Even when they were like Donald Trump, they're just weak little whiny babies. <laughs> To, to coin a phrase, but um, but uh, so I think this is good. I think you're going to be looking at candidates who aren't afraid to say what they believe. That's that's my belief. If it, if we don't do it now, I don't know when. This is this is upending everything right now, which is uh, dangerous, but also a fabulous opportunity because it's going to be different when we, when we come out of this. My feeling is if we communicate well, we can come out of this with people looking at Trump and Republicanism as a failure as many Republicans do now, and as Democrats as being the people who are going to pull us out of this. And I think Joe Biden, especially if he picks, uh, he, you know, he won't have a problem picking a competent vice president. I think that with the people who are being considered are all very competent. If he brings somebody who helps unite our side, that will help an awful lot. We need to bring in maybe a more progressive uh, vice president, my own humble opinion. Okay, there's a couple of things on the chat. Um, a couple things uh, that we're noticing about Nancy Pelosi that about her body language and her use of pauses and things like that. So uh, I'll just take this time to, if anybody wants to improve their public speaking abilities, I just want to put in a plug for Toastmasters. It's, uh, it's an amazing organization that can help you do that. Um, and then uh, to speak from uh, the heart and speak your truth, that will always help you be authentic and maybe take away some of that uh, sort of our aggressive uh, sounding and then um, a you, question, Jen. if you have time, could you repeat the truth sandwich for BBM? And I don't know what BBM is, but maybe you do, George. And, and it says, we are looking for a few phrases to put on a postcard to our precincts that need absentee ballots. Vote by mail. Vote by mail. Vote Thank by you. Mail. Okay. okay. I, I, I thought I had something to do with voting, but I was trying to think that through. Well, the, the, the truth sandwich is usually... Uh, or should be used when you are forced to confront an issue you'd rather otherwise not talk about. So I'm not sure if it's appropriate to do the victim, villain, hero thing uh, on a postcard about that. Um, but I'll repeat it again real quickly. You start by stating the truth and also uncovering the real issue. You then indicate that the lie is a distraction from that truth. And then the third part is you return to the truth and then always repeat the truth more than lies. And so that, that gives you a, um, just a quick way to think about that, that way of responding when you have to. And I'll, I'll point out it's 7.59 and we'll keep going if you like it, but if you do need to leave, I do understand. Um, see if there's any other. Um, or this how longer is, do you think you'll be going? Uh, um, another five minutes. Oh. George, this is Tom P.K. for again. Uh, so to kind of dovetail with what Jason was saying, since I'm kind of working on his campaign with him, um, you know, our uh, representative uh, voted against the bonding bill. And so I dug out what was in the bonding bill for our area to look at it. And the total of total dollars that were, that were going to, pour into Anoka County were about $36 million. That's something that we can go after our candidate on because she did vote against it, correct? I mean, that's something we can say, hey, you know, she, you know, this is what she could have brought into Anoka County with jobs and all these improvements that are, that were in the bonding bill, but she chose not to vote that way. Yeah, and then tie your values to that. So what effect does that have on people? And you did mention jobs. But it, it, it's also good to make that as personal as you, as you can, or more as people focused as you can. So saying things like, uh, uh, you know, in, in our area, we have people right now looking for jobs. We sure could have used those jobs right now, but, our, uh, but my opponent voted against bringing $36 million for jobs and for infrastructure development or whatever it was for. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, and decided that that was not money that was not well spent. Whereas what is well spent is when we do make sure that we take care of our of people, not our people, 
not after today. <laughs> Can we take care of people? Right. Thank Does that you. Make sense? Okay. And then real quick, I just wanted to point out also that uh, in the Nancy Pelosi video, she also used some tools that we'll get into later. She used story when she talked about um, the, uh, the other countries and what's happened with them and what they've done and how it's worked. And she used that story as a way to show Trump's failure. She used metaphor. It went by real quick. You might not have caught, uh, caught it, but she said, uh, what, you know, Rome is burning. And he's, you know, she used a metaphor there, which I thought was great. She talked and very explicitly stated the distraction, which is, uh, you know, tricky. And if you're good at it, you can do it. But she stated this is a, all of what Trump is saying, is, is saying is a distraction. She must have used the word distraction 10 times in there. So that was a message that got out there. Trump and the Republicans are distracting you. They're not dealing with the real issue. And then she states the real issue. I mean, it's great. Uh, I'll get it up on the website tomorrow. And if you want to have a look, uh, you can take a look at that and see and use it wherever you can. I don't know if I, I think we are using fair use here with that. We change it up. Any, um, let, let me just mention this also as to kind of close out. Um, please uh, let others know about this. If you're a member of a group, I know Linda's uh, it, you know, founder of the Rural Caucus and, uh, uh, and I know that Jan is in Michigan is Jan still here? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, and so, uh, hi, Jan. Oh, you're in France now, or Venice. <laughs> well, yeah, even people in Venice can come too. So uh, pass this around and uh, you can, uh, you know, we ask that people go and register so that they can, uh, so we have some idea of, how, of who's coming and then also it lets us connect with people later. So do that. Um, next week, we want to talk about uh, by conceptualism. If you've taken the workshop, we've talked about that before, but this idea that there are conservative values and liberal values, but those values and the ones I held up on that card are also shared by many, many conservatives. They just don't use those values in politics. So the values are not alien to them. So Virtually everyone is a biconceptual. In fact, uh, in one of Lakoff's books, he goes through and just names like 20 different kinds of conservatives and how their some of their values are the same as ours. Libertarians uh, share a number of values with us uh, and some of the more extreme values from Republicans. So we'll talk about that and some other things. And uh, uh, I guess, are there more questions? Anything else? Yeah, I'm seeing there's... Um... There's a, uh, about the length of the sessions, there's a couple people who said maybe we could go an hour and a half. So George and I'll talk about that and how that might look. Um, and uh, then uh, posting the link to register and uh, on Facebook. So we should um, make Yeah, you can Google, or I'm sorry, you can go to the search bar in uh, Facebook and search for Connections Lab. There is a Connections Lab Facebook page um, someday. I'll find a young person who likes to do Facebook <laughs> to keep that up a lot more. But, um, but it is on there. There is a link on there also. You can also forward the email that I sent out to anyone you want to, including groups you've got. Uh, and uh, we've opened this up to other states. Uh, the, uh, all the state party chairs across the country, uh, associate chairs and executive directors are on the mailing list also. And I've been kind of interested to see that there are a number a number of them open the emails and seem to really be interested in it. So, uh, and I'm hoping some of them have or will join. So, anything else from anybody? All right. Well, yeah, just a, a final quick question. Sorry, go ahead, Duane. Oh, um, thanks. A, a technology thing that I came across recently and I've been using for business purposes, it's real easy to use and it's actually free is that you can actually very easily create videos and send the videos out by email. And the email has an embedded GIF of the first few minutes of the video. So your email is, you know, the address and the subject line, they might say, you know, here's something, you know, here's the information I promised to send you about framing and then there's a video 
with the person actually talking visibly but no sound and then you click on the video and it goes to a full video and the person you send it to does not have to have an account with the technology and that's called a loom l-o-o-m l-o-o-m okay yeah. thanks thanks Julie. Yeah. jason yeah, just uh, to make sure, I know you said you're recording this, you're gonna put it on YouTube. Will we get a link to that? I had a couple of uh, team members that couldn't make it tonight, but we're really interested in actually watching this after the fact. I will do that. Uh, I gotta get the link up for the Nancy Pelosi video mm -hmm. tomorrow too. So look sometime tomorrow afternoon and that should all be there. Um, I'll put it, uh, I'll, I'll put it as a blog post so it'll show up. And then I'll also put it some other places for the future until I figure out exactly where I need to put it. So, yeah. so uh, the first thing that comes up when you hit the website is, uh, is the blog. So I'll make it a post. We'll go from there. Cool. All right. Everybody else, thank you. For every, anybody else leaves, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Tell others. And uh, Jan, thank you so much. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thank and, uh, you. That really helps. And say hi to Michelle and Lisa. And the I will. Wonderful folks, Dr. Kumar and everybody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.